welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is my wrap up for the Christie's Missing Readathon. Bonus, it is also my update on my Agatha Christie read through project because I read seven Agatha Christie books and they were all in order for my read through project, so perfect. So this is how this video is going to go. I am going to do a general, a brief thing about the Christie's Missing Readathon, and then I am going to uh, go through each of the seven full length books that I let, read that were, that fit in with my read through project. And, and then I'm going to go back and kind of do a final, maybe statistics about what I read for the Christie's Missing Readathon. The Christie's Missing Readathon ran from the 3rd to the 14th of December. It's during the 11 days when Agatha Christie went missing in 1926, which I think is a, is a really nice touch. The hosts this year uh, were Rachel Fryman, Berna from Berna's Bookish Adventures, Kevy from Say Kevy, and Naomi from Naomi's A Bookshelf. And they did a really great job hosting. They each hosted a team and Berna hosted Team Marvel, which I was part of, and we did not win, but we made a very strong effort, and so Team Marvel forever. <laughs> okay, I will go into some details about this um, after. Let's start with the books. Now, for my Agatha Christie read-through project, I read the books looking for specific things. I have been keeping my eye on, out on the Agatha Christie universe. I find that really interesting, especially when characters cross over between series. But I also keep my eye out for characters from previous novels in a series that show up in the book that I'm reading. So I'm going to uh, talk about anything that I found that is part of the Agatha Christie universe. I also look out for Shakespeare references because I noticed after the first few books that I read in this project that Agatha Christie really likes Shakespeare and so I, I note it whenever I find one, a reference to him in the books. Now, I have not read all of Shakespeare and I am not familiar with everything so it's very likely that I have missed some references but I highlight the ones that I do find. Then um, I take a look at the investigative method. Now, it's not for every detective. It's really the investigative detective, the investigative method of Poirot or Miss Marple, kind of the two main detectives in her books. I like to look at their methods and notice how they're different from each other and how consistent Agatha Christie was in writing the way that her detectives detect. And then I also look at clues, structure, and spoilers. Um, so that's gonna be the section of the video that is, I'm gonna have spoiler on the screen. So if you've not read that book before, um, there are very likely spoilers. And so um, you can skip ahead if you don't want to watch that part. I also keep my eye out for Two, two things that I noticed. One, in the Poirot books, there seems to be an ongoing focus on truth. I noticed that, and now I, I note it every time I see it. So if it's a Poirot book, I am going to be looking out for truth in those books. For Miss Marple, I noticed that it was justice, and so I keep my eye out for that as well. And that is going to be in the spoilery section as well because it depends on what I find. Sometimes it's toward the end of a book and it might be spoilery. The investigative method could, it'll depend on each book. It may be in the spoilery section or it may not be. So if, if you haven't read a book before, uh, feel confident watching my, my um, review until you see spoiler on the screen and then just fast forward until you don't see it anymore. First up, I read a Pocket Full of Rye. Now this one I technically read before December, so I can't count it for the Christie's Missing Readathon, but I needed to talk about this in this video. This is a book from 1953, and the synopsis is I've discovered, because I've also been reading John Curran's um, Agatha Christie's Complete Secret Notebooks, and I've really enjoyed his brief synopsis for each book. So 
when I give a synopsis, I'm, I'm giving it out of, of this book. So what I've been doing actually is I'll read the Agatha Christie book and then I'll read what he has to say about it or what um, he discovered Agatha Christie had to say about it in her notebooks. And that's been a really fun, a really fun way to do it as well. Back to a pocket full of rye. Here's the synopsis. Rex Fortescue is poisoned in his counting house. Another is poisoned during afternoon tea of bread and honey. And another is strangled while out hanging clothes. A macabre interpretation of the nursery rhyme brings Miss Marple to Yew Tree Lodge to investigate the presence of blackbirds. So this is another one of Agatha Christie books that has a connection to a nursery rhyme. There are quite a number that do. So that's another interesting thing. Um, Agatha Christie really seemed to like doing that. This one I ended up giving four stars to. I really enjoyed this Miss Marple. But as I look at my rankings list, the four stars make up right now the largest bulk. Um, so when I tell you where it sits as a ranking, you might be surprised, but keep in mind that my four stars make up a, a pretty large portion of that rankings list. 37 out of 64. Okay, so um, there was just one thing I noticed in, for universe stuff, and that, that that is that there is a mention of Sir Henry Clithering about how Marple has a reputation. Sir Henry Clithering knows her very well and how Miss Marple is fairly well known at Scotland Yard. And so that's, that's just fun. So for investigative method, none of these is uh, spoilery. So I'm just gonna share all of these. Here is a quote. So charming, so innocent, such a fluffy and pink and white old lady was Miss Marple that she gained admittance to what was now practically a fortress in a state of siege far more easily than could have been believed possible. Though an army of reporters and photographers were being kept at bay by the police, Miss Marple was allowed to drive in without question. So impossible would it have been to believe that she was anyone but an elderly relative of the family. I thought that was fascinating because Miss Marple definitely makes use of other people's perceptions of her <laughs> uh, when she is investigating. And I think there are times when she actually highlights her elderliness, her fluffiness. Um, Miss Marple is described as fluffy very often. And I think she highlights that so that people underestimate her. I, I do think that. Here's another quote. This is Inspector Neal. He was thinking to himself that Miss Marple was very unlike the popular idea of an avenging fury. And yet he thought that was perhaps exactly what she was. This is something else that Miss Marple is quite often described as, an avenging fury, as nemesis. Um, so I think that is also very interesting. Um, Neil again referring to Marple, uh, the quote is, nice old lady and very shrewd. <laughs> and then um, here are three comparisons with people that she knew. This is kind of one of her primary investigative methods is she will compare somebody, a suspect, to someone that she knows, usually from St. Mary Mead, and she will use that to kind of get a better understanding of that person or their characteristics. In a large armchair beside her, dressed in elaborate, elaborate black, was Mrs. Percival, talking away volubly at 19 to the dozen. Exactly, thought Miss Marple, like poor Mrs. Emmett, the bank manager's wife. Or, she reminds me of Mrs. Latimer in my own village, St. Mary Mead. Or, like young Elias who married Marion Bates. And then this is a quote from Miss Marple herself. Human nature is much the same everywhere, is it not? And a, a, a understanding of human nature is another thing that Miss Marple uses in her investigations to her advantage. She has a good understanding of human nature. Okay, now we're gonna dive into clues and structure. So this is the spoilery section. I'm going to put spoiler on the screen now. 
Um, I thought this had a good, strong start to it. Mr. Rex Fortescue is murdered in the first chapter, and I love that. I love when the murder happens right away in a book. We are given Inspector Neal's first impressions of the inhabitants of Yew Tree Lodge, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, his first impression of Mary Dove. It all seemed somehow just a little unreal, as though this young woman of under 30 was playing a part and not, he thought, the part of a housekeeper, but the part of Mary Dove. Her appearance was directed towards living up to her name. I thought that was very prescient considering what we learn later about Mary Dove. <laughs> Gladys looked both guilty and terrified. Adele Fortescue, the wife of Rex, liked me, but she would always like money even better. <laughs> Vivian Dubois, the type who specialized in the young wives of rich and elderly men. Jennifer Fortescue, the wife of Percival, discontented mouth, and she must be very bored. Uh, Miss Ramsbottom, a remarkable old lady. Elaine Fortescue, Rex's daughter, what seems to be genuine grief for the dead man. Percival, uh, Rex's son, Percy Prim, <laughs> and then Gerald Wright, Elaine's boyfriend, a thin, intellectual, and very superior young man. And then I thought that it was very interesting that we are not given Neil's first impression of Lancelot. Uh, we are given a, a, a long discussion that he has with Lance, but not his first impression. Miss Marple first appears on page 97 of this book, so she is in a good portion, but she does come in kind of late. We are given her first impressions of a few people as well. Her first impressions of Crump, who is on staff at the house, shifty-eyed, shifty-eyed, and scared to death, too. Pat, that's Lance's wife, Pat didn't somehow match with the interior of the house. Miss Marple liked her and felt sorry for her. There is a mention of something called general paralysis of the insane. <laughs> Whoa, right? Um, this is what Rex Fortescue is thought to have had. In the book, it's described this way. A condition with signs of megalomania and irritability which terminates sooner or later in hopeless insanity. Um, this struck me as unusual, so I did some research and discovered that this is a real thing. Um, it is considered a disease of dissolution, or disrepute, and degeneration, and there is a possible connection with syphilis. <laughs> so I just thought that was very interesting. Uh, Inspector Neal, when reading the news of the discovery of uranium deposits in Taganyika, he was, when he was reading that, I, uh, suddenly it struck me, where was the Blackbird Mine? So this mine, the Blackbird Mine, ends up playing a pretty big role in, in the book. And, um, and then I, um, this, this news, it's buried in a list of news. So he's reading the, the newspaper on the train, and the paragraph is this kind of list of the news that he is reading. 19 pages later, Neil is discussing the case with Marple and makes the connection between uranium deposits and the location of the Blackbird Mine. And I just thought this was classic of Agatha Christie to, to bury an important clue like that in a list of other things. Um, she does that quite often and always very well. Um, there was uh, stuff I noticed in here about justice Marple says, this is a wicked murderer, Inspector Neal, and the wicked should not go unpunished. And Miss Ramsbottom says, ah, well, you're a righteous woman, Jane Marple, and right must prevail. And then Marple says, I've finished what I came here to do. It hasn't been altogether pleasant, but it's important, you know, that wickedness shouldn't triumph. And then a little bit later, uh, this is kind of right at the very end. The tears rose in Miss Marple's eyes. Succeeding pity, there came anger. Anger against a heartless killer. And then, displacing both these emotions, there came a surge 
of Triumph. So that is A Pocket Full of Rye by Agatha Christie. Um, yeah, four stars. I really did enjoy that, that one. That was a good marble. All right, next up I read So Many Steps to Death or as it was originally titled, Destination Unknown. This is from 1954, and it is a standalone novel. Here's the synopsis. In order to solve the mystery of his disappearance, Hilary Craven agrees to impersonate the dead wife of scientist Thomas Betterton. She joins a mysterious group aboard a plane bound for a destination unknown. And when it lands in the middle of nowhere, she needs all her courage and wits. I gave this one four stars as well. I really enjoyed it. This is one of hers that's kind of like espionage adventure-y. Um, and I tend to really like those ones. Like, I feel like she really just has fun with these ones. And it is currently sitting at number 32 out of 64 on my rankings list. Now, this one... Um, because it's a standalone, there isn't anything about investigative method or uh, truth or justice. So we're just going to dive right in here to clues and structure. So I'm going to put spoiler on the screen right away. If you haven't read it yet, then um, fast forward until you don't see spoiler anymore. Quote, the man behind the desk moved a heavy, heavy paperweight four inches to the right. It would have been difficult to guess his age. He looked neither old nor young. His face was smooth and unwrinkled, and in his eyes was a great tiredness. I, I wrote that down because it's one of the reasons why I love Agatha Christie. I love that. I love the way that she writes that. And I just thought in that, um, in those two sentences, or like in that paragraph, that short paragraph, she really nailed this guy like we are given so much information about the character of this guy I, I just thought it was great there were um repetitions or themes of escape and imprisonment uh characters talked about having no way out which was interesting it's 1954 and scientists are going missing most people are assuming that it is something to do with communism, that, that, they're, that they're disappearing behind the Iron Curtain. And so I thought that was, that was really interesting. And especially to get um, kind of the view of communism from that early time. 1954 is still quite early in that, um, you know, the Iron Curtain time period. Um, Hillary is in this place where all the scientists are. Uh, they they have to listen periodically um, to this man, the leader, speaking to them. And even that, between that and the way that they're forced to live, that they're not allowed to leave this place and it's very structured, it struck me that in this book anyway, it struck me how close or similar communism and fascism are. Uh, dictators, freedom, compliance to a cause. Here's a quote um, when Hillary is at this meeting where the, the leader is speaking. There was more of it, all the same heady, intoxicating stuff, but it was not the words themselves. It was the power of the orator that carried away an assembly that could have been cold and critical had it not been swayed by that nameless emotion about which so little is known. And then we get the twist where Hillary discovers that it is not about communism or the Iron Curtain at all. There is one very, very wealthy man who is collecting scientists. He is collecting scientists, one, because he's a collector, and two, because he can then sell them to the highest bidder. It's about making more money for himself. And this was a great twist that I did not see coming. I loved that. Then there was another twist at the end of the book. We find out that the warrant out for Tom, you learn earlier that one of the reasons why Tom is okay with um, staying where he is and not going back to his normal life is because there is a warrant out on him. And through most of the book, you are under the impression that that warrant has to do with him selling secrets. But we discover that the warrant 
wasn't for selling secrets. It was for murdering his first wife. It was a great reveal. I liked that a lot. And then finally, the final twist that I also didn't figure out is that Andrew Peter is Boris Glider. And I thought that that was fantastic. Um, I really love that in the end, the book is not about communism or fascism. It's about plain old greed and murder. And I just thought to myself, she did it again. She did it again. A book where I thought that it was going to be political and it, it turned out to be about the, the plain old motives that most murders um, and mysteries are about. And so again, well done, Angela Christie. I really enjoyed this one. There is a one Shakespeare reference at the end. Here's a quote. I sent Hillary Craven off on a journey to a destination unknown, but it seems to me that her journey's end is the usual one after all. And that is a reference to Fest, um, the clown in Twelfth Night. He sings journeys end in lovers meetings, um, in lovers meeting. Uh, so there you go. There is a <laughs> Shakespeare quote for you. Okay, I then I read Spider's Web. This is a novelization of Agatha Christie's play. The novelization is written by Charles Osborne. I would have loved to have gotten my hands on her play, but I do not have access to that, so I read the novelization. Um, here is the synopsis. Oh, the play was written in 1954, and this novelization is from 2000. When she discovers a murdered body in her drawing room shortly before her diplomat husband is due home with an important politician, Clarissa devises a plan to fool the police. She enlists the help of three house guests, unaware that the murderer is closer to home than she could possibly think. I also gave this one four stars. I really enjoyed it, and it's currently sitting at number 31 out of 64 on my rankings list. I love that there is a map of the drawing room at the beginning. So you can actually see if this was a play, this is how the stage would be set up. I thought that was fantastic. Rowland makes a reference to the poem, 10 Little Indians, after the inspector says, so that leaves just three people. And I would include that in the universe thing, because this is from 1954, so it's definitely after she wrote And Then There Were None, um, showing that that was a, po a poem that was, you know, people were well aware of that poem at the time period. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was cool. I really would love to read the original play. I found the movie um, on YouTube, and I haven't finished it yet, but I've started watching it. It's from 1982, I think and it stars Penelope Keith, and it looks really fun. Um, so yeah, what I would say about this one is there, I want to read the original play because I thought the plot was fantastic. And, and there was also an element of farce that would be really funny to see staged. So I, I enjoyed the book, but I really, really would like to see the play. The character of Clarissa is amazing. I thought she was fantastic and the whole scenario for this was just great. Um, yeah, I really, I really did enjoy that one. Okay, and then I read Hickory Dickory Dock from 1955. Here's the synopsis. A series of mysterious thefts in the student hostel run by Miss Lemon's sister in Hickory Road culminates in the death of one of the students. The incongruity of the object stolen attracts the attention of Hercule Poirot, who visits the hostel just before the first death. Um, I enjoyed this one, but it is not my favorite. I gave it three stars, and so it is currently sitting at 53 out of 64 on my rankings list. Here is some universe stuff that I discovered. This is Miss Lemon's first appearance in a full-length novel. She's been seen previously in two short stories, How Does Your Garden Grow and Nemean Lion. Nemean Lion is from The Labors of Hercules. Um, the Countess Vera Rosakoff. We first meet the Countess in the 1923 short story, The Double Clue. 
We next see her in the 1927 novel, The Big Four. She is last seen in the short story, The Capture of Cerberus from the 1947 collection, The Labors of Hercules. Um, and she is mentioned in the 1940 novel, One to Buckle My Shoe. Here is the quote where she's mentioned in this book. He was disapproving. He found Patricia's well-bred, unaccented tones wearisome to the ear. She is intelligent and cultured, this girl, he said to himself, and alas, every year she will grow more boring. In old age, his mind darted for a fleeting moment to the memory of the Vera, of the Countess Vera Rosakoff. What exotic splendor there, even in decay, these girls nowadays. So I love that even though um, he had, he, he never really spent a lot of time with her, there was something about the Countess Vera Rosakoff that really struck Poirot. And so, um, yeah, I find that fascinating. And as far as I know, that's the last time that she's mentioned in Poirot books, but we'll see. Inspector Sharp, who is the inspector in here, has worked with Poirot before, quote, on that business at Cray's Hill. Um, and this is, as far as I can tell, this is not from a previous book. So it's in the universe, but um, we've never met Inspector Sharp before. There is a reference to Mrs. McGinty's dead in a conversation between students at the hostel. Quote, who's this private eye? Never heard of him. Oh, I have. There was a man who was condemned to death for the murder of a charwoman. And this detective got him off at the last moment by finding the real person. <laughs> And then lastly, there is a, a reference or there is a character in here called Mr. Endicott, who is a lawyer. And he makes reference to that Abernathy business. And that's from after the funeral. But the lawyer there in that book is called Entwistle. Endicott does say that he is indebted to Poirot for clearing up that business for him. And so I was wondering if they're two different people or if this is an instance where Agatha Christie just got her names wrong, <laughs> which I have not seen before. So it's a very rare instance. Um, yeah, but I always thought that that was really interesting. And then for investigative method, um, on the very first page, we read order and method had been Hercule Poirot's watchwords from many years ago. And then there's a quote, um, Poirot says, I am vexed with myself, he said to Miss Lemon. I have departed from the principles of order and method. So I did enjoy this, I just didn't love it, which is why I gave it a three. Remember that a three, a three means that I did like the book. Um, so even though it's very low on the rankings, that's just because there are so many that I really did enjoy. Um, so that is Hickory Dickory Dock. Okay, and then I read Dead Man's Folly from 1956. This is a reread for me, um, but I read it again in, in my read-through project because I want to read them in the order that they were published. The synopsis is, Mrs. Oliver organizes a murder hunt in the grounds of Nass House. When the body turns out to be only too real, Hercule Poirot is on hand to discover who killed schoolgirl Marlene Tucker and what happened to Lady Foliot. Agatha Christie obviously uses her beloved Greenway as the inspiration for this location. Greenway is her house in Devon. And I love that the David Suchet adaptation of this book is filmed there. I thought that was a very nice nod to Agatha Christie. Um, I, I really did like that. I gave this one four stars. I really enjoyed this one as well. And it's currently sitting at number 41 out of 64 on my rankings list. There's some universe stuff that I discovered. Um, Miss Lemon is in this book as well. And she was last seen in Hickory Dickory Dock. Ariadne Oliver is in this one and I love her so much. Um, she was last seen in Mrs. McGinty's Dead from 1952. Um, and here is a quote <laughs> uh, about Ariadne Oliver. The inspector was slightly startled by the sight of Mrs. Oliver. He had not expected anything so voluminous, so purple, 
and in such a state of emotional disturbance. I feel awful, said Mrs. Oliver, sinking down in the chair in front of him like a purple blancmange. Awful, she added in what were clearly capital letters. <laughs> I just love Agatha Christie's humor, and I, I don't think that she gets enough credit for it. Um, she is actually quite funny in her books, um, in her descriptions of characters and, and whatever, and, and I, thought, I think that that's the perfect example of Agatha Christie's humor. Inspector Bland is the inspector on this case, and he met Poirot on a case when he was a sergeant. And it's not from a previous book, so it's just another instance of an inspector kn knowing Poirot from when they were younger. Okay, let's move into uh, some clues and structure. So I'm going to put spoiler on the screen. If you've not read this book before and you want to, then fast forward until you don't see spoiler anymore. Quote, if the foundations are rotten, everything's rotten. This is archi architect Michael speaking. It is profound what you say there, said Poirot. Yes, it is profound. And I believe that he is referring to the folly, um, although I, I, can't, I can't remember for sure. And if he is, then that's very prescient because in the end, Poirot uh, figures out that the, the true Lady Stubbs has been murdered and she's buried under the folly. Uh, another quote, so much depends on how you look at a thing, laughed Warburton. It is very, uh, that is a very profound truth, Poirot says. So I thought that was very interesting that twice when he was talking to people in this book, he says that it's a profound truth. Um, and But Warburton is right. It's, it depends on how you look at a thing because we learn that the Lady Stubbs that we meet in this book is not the real Lady Stubbs. Lady Stubbs was murdered and this other woman took her place. And um, the, the real um, Lady Stubbs or, like, is um, Hetty, I think her name is. And, um, and she is murdered and then this, this other woman takes her place. Um, I also thought that it was very interesting that, that um, there is a, there's another young victim. The victim in this one is, she's 14 years old. She's a girl guide who agreed to play the body in the murder game and she gets murdered. Um, the victim in Halloween Party is about the same age, maybe she's 13. Um, and that's another instance of a young victim. That's not going to be published until 1969. And yet, um, it seems to me that more people mention Halloween Party when they talk about young victims than Dead Man's Folly. But Dead Man's Folly came first. Uh, so yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Um, and then I noticed as I was reading that Mrs. Now, of course, this was a reread, but I did, it, it was been a, it's been a few years. I did notice that Mrs. Folliot refers to Hattie in the past tense. And this is in a conversation with Poirot after the murder and while Lady Stubbs is missing. Lady Stubbs has gone missing. And um, I noticed it uh, because it was Hattie, Hattie that she was referring to in the past tense. She doesn't refer to Lady Stubbs in the past tense, but Hattie. And so I thought that was that was really interesting. So I did enjoy Dead Man's Folly. I always love it when Ariadne Oliver is in a book. And uh, yeah, that was very entertaining. Okay, and then I read 450 from Paddington, um, which is from 1957. Here's the synopsis. While traveling to visit her friend, Miss Marple, Elspeth McGillicuddy witnesses a murder committed on a train running parallel with hers. During the search for the body, attention focuses on Rutherford Hall, home of the Crackenthorpe family. Miss Marple and her agent, Lucy Islesboro, investigate. Okay, so first of all, I just have to say, she was wow with the names in this book. Elspeth McGillicuddy and Lucy Islesboro. <laughs> Love it. 
Okay, this one I also gave four stars to. I really enjoyed this one, and this one's at 23 out of 64 on my rankings list. Some universe stuff that I that I found. Dr. Haydock is mentioned in this book, and he is last seen in The Body in the Library from 1942. Griselda is also briefly in this book, and she's also last seen in The Body in the Library. And Inspector Craddock is in this book. He is the godson of Sir Henry Clithering, and he is seen previously in A Murder is Announced from 1950. For investigative method, there were a lot of descriptions of Miss Marple in this book, and I love the juxtaposition between her mind and her body. Listen to these. An elderly, frail, old lady. Everybody in St. Mary Mead knew Miss Marple, fluffy and dithery in appearance, but inwardly as sharp and as shrewd as they make them. Though in speech Miss Marple was woolly and diffuse, in mind she was clear and sharp. Pink and elderly fragility. <laughs> Miss Marple was looking particularly woolly and fluffy, a picture of a sweet old lady. And then he, Sir Henry Clithering, described her as just the finest detective God ever made, natural genius cultivated in a suitable soil. Um, and then Marple herself says, a slight knowledge of human nature. It is so helpful. I always feel when people remind you of other people because types are alike everywhere and that is such a valuable guide. And that right there is so much of her investigative method. Okay, we're gonna get into some clues or structure, so I'm gonna put spoiler on the screen. This book has one of the best openings slash murders. I love the setup for this mystery, that Mrs. McGillicuddy is on a train and she sees a murder happening on another train passing by her. And trying to get anybody to believe her, um, I just love that setup. Also, that the murder happens right at the beginning of the book. I love that as well. And then I loved this quote. Elspeth, Jane, they kissed. And without preamble or circumlocution, Mrs. McGilligutty burst into speech. Oh, Jane, she wailed. I've just seen a murder. <laughs> love it. And then, of course, there is a little bit about justice at the end. And I am really very, very sorry finished Miss Marple, looking as fierce as a fluffy old lady can look, that they have abolished capital punishment, because I do feel that if there is anyone who ought to hang, it's Dr. Quimper. So yes, I loved, I loved uh, 450 from Paddington. Really, really good. All right, and then last but not least is Ordeal by Innocence from 1958. Here's the synopsis. Jacko Argyle died in prison while serving a sentence for the murder of his adoptive mother. His alibi for the fatal night was never substantiated until now. Arthur Calgary arrives at the family home and confirms Jacko's alibi, but the real killer is still among the family, ready to kill again. Um, this one, the house in this one where the family live is called Sunny Point. But before the family moved in, it was called Viper's Point. And that is why this cover then makes so much sense. At first, I was like, what on earth is that about? But that is why, because before the name was changed, it was called Viper's Point. There is a mention of the Lizzie Borden case twice, which I thought was really interesting. Once by Marshall, the lawyer, and then once by Hughes, the detective. So I thought that was really interesting. Something about this case reminded them of the Lizzie Borden case, and so I thought that was interesting. I also think that it's interesting because um, by, by referring to cases in the real world, Agatha Christie is putting her detectives and her universe in the real world as well, and I just, I, I like that. I thought that was cool. I ended up giving this one four and a half stars. I really, I really, really enjoyed this one. This is another standalone. 
and I get it's currently sitting at 19 out of 64 on my rankings list. There is a few Shakespeare references in here, um, not a quote, but a Shakespeare mention um, that two of them are going to hear a lecture on criminal types in Shakespeare, which I thought was cool. And then another mention is she has a bubble, which he's referring to her car, um, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's he, basically he's saying that she's got a car that's unreliable I think um, and then a character says I feel a kind of pricking in my thumbs and both of those last two references are of course to Macbeth okay uh, just a few um, clues or structures so I'm gonna put spoiler on the screen um, Jacko although technically innocent um, is very at, at the time at the time when I had this thought in the book um, according to Al Arthur Calgary Jacko is innocent because Calgary is his alibi um, although Jacko is very Jacko is innocent he is very unlikable wouldn't it have been better for the innocent to let him continue to be guilty that's the big question in this book was you know because of the innocent if, if Jacko is proven to be innocent, then the entire family is under suspicion again. And that means that the innocent are under suspicion as well as whoever is guilty. And that's a, a major theme in this book, uh, that truth must be discovered to protect the innocent comes up in multiple times in Poirot books. For example, it comes up in Hercule Poirot's Christmas. Um, and I just think that that's an interesting thought and obviously one that, that Christy kind of had on her mind because it shows up in multiple books um, that this idea that um, rather than letting it go, which is what some of the characters want in this book, that the truth needs to ultimately come out in order to protect the innocent. Um, and I thought that was that was cool. Okay, and that's actually about it that um, that I wrote down. I just I ended up just really enjoying reading this story, and I didn't make a ton of notes um, because I just really enjoyed it. Um, I didn't have any investigative method or truth or justice because this is a standalone, but it is one that I really really did enjoy. Okay, so those are the Agatha Christie books um, that I wanted to include that that I did for my read through project. So now let's talk about. The Christie's Missing Readathon. For a closed circle mystery, I read Ordeal by Innocence because um, the killer had to have been one of the family in the house. For the short story prompt, I read a number of short stories. So from Midwinter Murder, I read A Christmas Tragedy, which was a Miss Marple short story. And I loved that one. I gave that one five stars. I read The Chocolate Box, which is a Poirot short story. And I gave that one five stars as well. I read The Coming of Mr. Quinn, which I gave four stars to. Um, the Mystery of the Baghdad Chest, which is a Poirot. And I gave that one four stars. And The Clergyman's Daughter, which is a Tommy and Tuppence. And I gave that one four stars as well. So I really did enjoy the, the stories that I read in this collection and I'm not quite done, but almost I've, I'm continuing to read this collection for, oh, and then for the, the, the last short story I read was The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding. Um, and I read this one also for Christy Fest. It worked out, timed out really well, actually. Um, and this is a Poirot and I really did enjoy that one. That was a five star. Uh, short story as well for featuring your team's detective I read 450 from Paddington my team's detective of course is Miss Marple for um, a golden age author I read death of Jezebel by Christiana Brand I really really liked this one I thought this was fantastic it's kind of a locked room mystery and um, it was, yeah, it was really, really good. I, I marked a few things. There is a cast of characters at the beginning and then this little picture that shows the stage. So there's this group of people who are putting on a medieval themed pageant show 
in this exhibition space. And so, so this is really important to understanding the mystery. So there's a picture here showing the stage, the tower and the balcony, the assembly room, the doorway leading to the dressing rooms and the positions of the 11 knights in armor. Isabel brattled, prattled gaily on and all unconscious of their doom, the little victims played. The kill had been selected, the killer at hand. The bystanders were gathering at the scene of execution and Isabel, with every careless word, knocked yet another nail into the highly complicated structure of double murder. I just liked how I just liked that how how that was written. And then also this is a projection. This is a quote of the sealed room mystery. The scene of the murder was bounded on one side by a stage under the obs observation of several thousand pairs of eyes and on the other by a locked door with somebody sitting on guard on the other side of it. The murderer must have been within these confines and the place is as bare as a biscuit box, so that there is nowhere where he can possibly have hidden or remain hidden. With the exception of two people, all the people who were on the scene of the murder are here now. With the exception of these two people, everyone who could have sent the threatening notes is here now. Eight of these people, he waved his, hands to his hand toward the attendant knights, could not have sent the notes. Therefore, the suspects are automatically reduced to the six who could. Miss Kirk and this man Anderson are missing. For the rest, we have Betchley, Mr. Port, Mr. Exmouth, and Mr. Brian Bryan, coyly referred to by Miss Drew as Brian twice. So I love that kind of really succinct, uh, you know, description that this is a locked room mystery and also a closed circle mystery. And I really, really liked this one. Okay, I also read for that prompt of a golden age author, I read Hickory Dickory Dock and Dead Man's Folly. For a retelling or a book about Agatha Christie, I, I went with the novelization by Charles Osborne of her play Spider's Web. Then there was the bonus team movie night. Watch your group's adaptation. And so for Team Marvel, we watched The Mirror Cracked, which is an, a movie from 1980 starring Miss Marple, at, starring Miss Marple, starring Angela Lansbury as Miss Marple. And it was really good. And I loved watching it with a group of people and chatting as we watched it. That was really, really fun. I also watched the Team Poirot uh, pick no I can't remember but we watched and then there were none from 1945 which was very interesting um, I like it was very interesting how they changed the story uh, I thought that was the most interesting thing about that movie so yeah and then of course there was the group read of and then there were none and this one I listened to and then there were none because I've read it multiple times before. So I wanted to experience it a new way. So I, I listened to it read by Dan Stevens and it was great. I really, really enjoyed that. So there you have it. That is my wrap up of the Christie's Missing Readathon. Thanks again to the hosts. This was so much fun. I loved the chats and discussions that we had on Discord. I loved, uh, doing group watches of, of these movies. It was just a lot of fun. And that was my review of the, the last seven Agatha Christie books that I have read. I promise not to do that many in a video again. Uh, but this is what it is. Uh, this is your Christmas present from me to you. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.